you guys have youth at the backcourt in a key position when you're trying to run offense and set up shots. Uh, Duke obviously has youth. Is there? Do you see parallels to kind of the ups and downs you guys are having and they're having at this point in this tricky kind of season? Well, I think we probably both have some ideas about, boy, we wish those freshmen would grow up a lot faster, but uh, they have that security blanket of Jordan Goldwire uh, because I'm just looking at the stats, 48 assists and 18 turnovers. That's a pretty good security blanket. And and Jordan's probably uh, doing a lot of things offside the court too. They're, they're young guys and we don't really have anybody in the point guard position or the positions that we have uh, guards all the time. We don't have anybody with that kind of experience to help them out. But uh, uh, there are some similarities, I'm sure. Both of us are probably frustrated at, at times, but also have to be understanding because what the kids are doing now is much different than what they were doing last year. Josh Graham, then CL. Coach, there's um the historic piece of this game. There's the stat that's been thrown around that this is the first time you guys have met in 61 years, both being unranked. I think you would have been nine years old at the time. So rather than asking what memories you might have at nine, unless you have a good story, what's the uh, earliest memories you have of this rivalry watching it? Oh, man. Probably junior or senior year in high school, which would have been, you know, 67, 68, because uh, uh, some of the old guys, I mean, I was so much more into baseball until summer after my freshman year in high school, but uh, I'd never uh, seen an ACC game in person until I played in the preliminary, my freshman year playing on the freshman team. Uh, uh, but I knew that uh, Duke's success around, uh, um, I did follow basketball a little bit. I think it was 64, 65, somewhere around in there that uh, they did go to the final four, but uh, not until uh, my junior or senior year in high school did I uh, get the uh, idea of the rivalry. And it was even more so after I, after I got here as a student. Thank you. CL, then Mark Armstrong. Hey, Roy, kind of good, good going back to the youth theme, um, this game, this rivalry can kind of cause a, a, a kid playing in it for the first time to get overexcited and, you know, expend a lot of energy uh, before tip off really sometimes. But in this pandemic year, there's not going to be a crowd and everything in Cameron. In what ways do you think it, the game itself will kind of be different, especially for for the young guys playing in it? You know, CL, that's a good question. And I've been asking that all year long, how they're going to react to going into gyms, nobody there, going into a place where it's 2,000 or whatever it was at uh, uh, Clemson the other night. It's all uh, not normal for what we've seen in ACC basketball. But uh, by this time of the year, I think the kids are uh, understanding that part of it. Uh, I think they would be shocked. Uh, if they came into the Smith Center and all of a sudden there's 21,000 people in there and they would be shocked if they went into Cameron and it was completely full. Uh, but what we're doing is we're going in there and playing the same scenario that we've been playing all year. And uh, yes, the Duke game is a huge game. And yes, uh, uh, it'll always be a, a huge game. Neither one of us have had the success so far that we would like to have. Uh, but uh, they'll listen to the, uh, the upperclassmen about the, a lot of the games, but uh, uh, this year is so unusual. I don't know what to expect from one day to the next, so I don't even know how to uh, think about what they may be thinking themselves. Mark Armstrong, then Andrew Jones. Uh, you may have kind of started to answer my question there, Roy. I've seen a lot of chatter amongst fans that they even forgot this game was coming up. Does it feel the same, aside from everything else we're all dealing with, does it feel in any way different the dynamic given the relative lack of success you've both enjoyed this year or just as intense leading up as it would always be? Well, it'll always be intense because it's Duke and North Carolina, but you're right. Uh, uh, we have some wounds we're trying to um, get them healed and some problems we're trying to get fixed. That uh, I don't want to speak for Mike's team, but uh, I would assume that they have those same kind of feelings that we do, just trying to get better every day. And then all of a sudden, wow, we're getting ready to play Duke. and we're nowhere near where we want to be. I know that part of it for sure, but uh, it is, it's such a, uh, a different world that we live in, but also I'm very happy about the fact that uh, it's a different world for um, 
me as a coach uh, to understand what the kids are going through every single day. It's, it's different. It's hard trying to figure out what those kids are feeling and uh, uh, with mom and dad and the people around them and what they're experiencing. I've never, uh, I've never had a scenario like we have right now with truthfully seven of our top 10 players are freshmen or seven of 11, seven or 10, some, either one of those. Uh, and so for me as a coach, it's, it's been a learning experience, but it's been also been a hard learning experience, but it's been, been that every single day and every single game. Andrew, then Brendan. Hey, Coach. What kind of problems does Matthew Hurt present? And is he one of the more unique players in the league that finding a guy that can kind of stick with him and keep him from getting looks is maybe one of the bigger challenges you have facing anybody? Yeah, the you know, there's some guys in the league that uh, – big guys who can shoot the ball from range. I don't know that there's anybody that does it as well as Matt does. And then – when he goes down in the low post and shoots that little turnaround fadeaway, it's uh, it's pretty automatic too. So I think it's a little bit of a different challenge. There are other guys who can shoot it, but I don't know that uh, uh, anybody does it any better than uh, uh, than Matt does for sure. We tried to recruit him really, really hard ourselves, and so I've seen him play a lot. But uh, his is a little different. Uh, he gets he gets a lot of shots. They need him to get a lot of shots. Uh, uh, and he makes a lot. I'm just looking at 53% and uh, 69 of those 173 shots or three point shots. So that's a, that's a heck of a percentage right there for a guy big or little. And uh, I think that he is a little more unique than the rest of the big guys in our league that shoot it so well. Thank you. Brandon and Jared Fialco. Hey, Roy. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you another sort of historical question. Um, when you think back on the history of the rivalry, the games you've watched and obviously been a part of, what is it that, that sets certain ones apart? Is it the stakes? Is it the teams? Is it the endings? But in your opinion, what sort of makes for the best UNC Duke games that you've experienced? Oh, boy, that's an unusual question for me. I think that you're always going to have the big, big game attitude and, and uh, the spectacle and the uh, you know, the pageantry around it uh, that is taken away with the no fans in the stands. If I had to pick one, I would think uh, when the stakes are the highest, those are the games that I remember the most. It's uh, the last game of the year for a conference championship or the who's going to get a number one seed or, or what it is. And, you know, these games are usually in the second half of the season. Uh, it's not one that we don't normally play Duke, the first conference game or anything like that when you're not too sure about your team. So, I would think that the most special ones to me are either one of two things. It's uh, where the stakes are really, really high or it's senior day for me, us here. And for me, the way I feel about our seniors typically, I think those are the ones that are usually uh, are the most memorable for me. Thank you. Jared Fialco, then Greg Barnes. To follow up on that, Roy, this is a series that is marked by these indelible moments in time that are never forgotten. When you think of the series, is there a specific image or a specific emotion that comes to your mind? Oh, no, I don't know that I could pick one. There are a lot of emotions, you know, Tyler Hansbro walking off the court bleeding like that. Uh, uh, Danny Green with the big dunk over at their place. Uh, the negative side, Austin Rivers making that uh, – uh, three in our building, uh, going over there and, uh, with Marcus Page and Bryce Johnson and winning the conference regular season and beating them on their senior day. Uh, there's there's a lot of those memories. Uh, last year's game, I've tried to erase them because there are all so many negative memories with last year's game, and I'm afraid that it may uh, last longer than the rest of them forever. Greg and Davis. Hey, Roy, know that turnovers are a part of the game, but it, but it seems like, for a lack of a better word, there have been some, some head scratchers uh, in, in recent weeks. Are you, do you have to, to coach turnovers a little bit different and how you handle them in practice when there are some that just seem a bit baffling? You know, Greg, it, I think they are head scratchers or baffling or frustrating or whatever you can, uh, you can describe them with that. They're, it's really... Uh, something that irritates every coach irritates me a great deal because we've emphasized it so much and we thought we were making strides and we finally got more assist and we had turnovers which we've never had a team that had the problem getting there and then all of a sudden we turn around and go south immediately against Clemson again so 
it's it's a frustrating thing. It's uh, uh, it definitely for sure something I haven't been able to uh, find the answers to, or I would have already figured it out, and I would have already changed. Excuse me, uh, but no, it's it is frustrating, and we can say all we want that we got, you know, uh, RJ's a freshman, Caleb's a freshman, Kerwin's a freshman, you know, all those Anthony played four games last year, but. The bottom line is we got to stop turning the daggum ball over if you want to be really good. And that's got to be something our kids have got to buy into more. I mean, we're running them more after turnovers in practice. Uh, we're screaming at them. We're putting an arm around them and say, okay, this is the reason you made the mistake. Uh, and so far, I haven't found the right way to cure it. Davis, then Ross. Hey, Coach, you said anytime you win a big game on the road that you're stealing their brownies. I was just wondering, where did that phrase come from? Wow. Uh, I have no idea. I just started thinking about it or started saying something about it just in a joking manner 100 years ago. And uh, uh, that's when I was at Kansas that we wanted to really be a good team on the road and uh, you know, it was silly and it's still silly, but uh, uh, I, I really don't have any idea. I think I don't have many original ideas and the ones I do are usually bad. So uh, that probably fits into that category. Ross, then Adam Smith. Hey, Coach, uh, hopefully asking this near the end of the press conference, but uh, after the Clemson game, you mentioned Clemson uh, was not a sloopy dog. Could you kind of explain that reference and what you meant by that? I just meant it's not a team, it's a bad basketball team. It had nothing to do with Snoop Dogg. I might have said Snoopy Doll, and you thought I said dog. I have no idea. It was just uh, I get frustrated sometimes that we don't give the other team credit. And, uh, you know, we're not playing. I'm looking at uh, uh, 5, 10, 15, 16, 17 pictures up there. What it means is we're not playing – you 17 guys, we were playing a basketball team that's very good, particularly on the defensive end of the floor. If we were playing 17 faces, we looked at out a pair, I wouldn't be talking about that because we'd beat the hell out of you guys. <laughs> Adam Smith and Alyssa. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, hey, good luck following that one, Adam. Well, Roy, just to be clear, I had told Ross that I, th I thought that might have been a droopy dog. You've made droopy dog references over the years, I feel like. I didn't know if Sloopy and Droopy were tied together. But anyway, um, <laughs> what, you, you, you mentioned earlier that, that it has almost become normal, not normal, but you've almost become used to playing in places that are empty or, or, or you know, limited capacity. Is at Cameron, when that place is full, because it's so compacted and tight, do you have to yell the most there to get your point across when it's a normal season and things are pretty wild there? And also, like, do you think that that when you go there Saturday, that the, just the fact that, you know, that it, it will be empty, will that be – do you think that would be the weirdest of the situations that you've played in this year of just the empty buildings? You know, I don't know that it'll be any more weird than any of the other places because it's just weird, unusual, whatever terminology you want to, want to use. But uh, it's something that by now you've almost become used to, so it's not as weird anymore. But, uh, no, I think their crowd is fantastic. Uh, uh, it is a smaller place. The sound in there is really difficult. It makes it difficult for you to communicate with your uh, team, whether I yell louder or uh, more often, usually – uh, it's dictated by how good they are and how well we're playing. But uh, that is a place that it is harder to communicate with your guys. It's just like uh, I hope the Smith Center is hard to communicate when uh, the other team's trying to communicate with their players. But uh, it's uh, – I don't think uh, – really, guys, I mean, when I walk out on the court, when I walk through the tunnel, when I walk out there on Saturday, I notice that there's nobody there. Then when the game starts, I, I'm really not that concerned uh, about who's there, who's not there. I mean, I'm trying to focus on what's going on in the court. And, yes, they, they can hear me easier uh, most of the time. Most, not perfect for sure, most of the time uh, I don't yell things that I'm embarrassed for anybody else to hear. Most of the time I'm yelling things that I think will help us uh, uh, play better. And so uh, – 
I'm not embarrassed uh, most of the time by things I say. Time for two last questions, Alyssa Ray and then Kip. Last two, go ahead. Coach, an uncharacteristic down game from Armando on Tuesday. How has he responded in practice to that, especially with this game coming up on Saturday? I have no idea. We gave him Wednesday off. Uh, we're going to practice later this afternoon. But uh, Armando uh, has been, in reality, our most uh, uh, is trying to use the right term, a consistent player. Uh, had a great stretch early, the first, I don't know, pick out eight or nine games, and then had a couple that weren't quite as good. And then two great games before the Clemson game. And uh, I have no idea how he'll bounce back. I would expect. Uh, that he'll bounce back really well. But a lot of that is determined by the competition that he's playing every night, too. It's uh, Some guys are more effective uh, uh, against our big guys. Some teams double teams. Some teams take things away. So he's just got to handle it because it. Uh, he just didn't play well. Uh, he wasn't nearly as active. He got frustrated by some things, and he's uh, got to be a little more mature. But he just did not play well. Last question, Kip. Yeah, Roy, uh, logistically, when when you've been on the bench and your players are all spread out at unfamiliar places, has there been a time this season when you looked around to send a guy in and could not find him for some reason? Yes. Uh, you know, I've looked around, okay, where is he and that kind of thing. Uh, so there there is something to that. And even my staff, like uh, uh, Kendall is now keeping – total fouls and timeouts and I'm trying to find out you know how many fouls is that and it's 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 harder to find uh, uh, but that's that's part of the being unusual but Kip I think that you should talk to Kirsch because every press conference we have I think it may be because he thinks you're the oldest you get the last freaking question I think you ought to pull seniority status and tell him you want to answer the first question next time <laughs>